Oolongs are some of the teas closest to my heart for the sheer variety of flavor profiles. From lightly oxidized Pouchongs over medium baked, intensely floral or milky teas to the dark roasted and deeply baked teas I so often crave. It was time for me to visit Taiwan, the country that is most closely connected with oolongs as one of their major tea varieties. On the way I decided to visit some of our sources of dried herbs and fruits in Thailand, which led me to a cycle trip from Bangkok to the ancient Cambodian temple city of Angkor Wat. I spent a week cycling through rice paddies, pineapple cassava fields, mango plantations and forests. Angkor was a magical place and one feels very small in the presence of thousands of years of history. What was life like when these incredible monuments were built? I can only imagine, but I'm sure it was harder than today. With these thoughts, I set out to my visit to the mountains of Taiwan to connect with some of our suppliers and hopefully fortune friendships. So this is one of the teas I brought back from Taiwan. Um, I really like this. It's a dark smoked, uh, deep baked oolong. So this is from Ali Shan. It's a very famous mountain and it's gonna have a really nice roast. It has a really nice roasted flavor. So what was um, what was Taipei like while you were there? Taipei was um, I like Taipei a lot actually. It wasn't what I expected at all. It's um, it was quite different than some of the other Southeast Asian cities where there's a lot of you know traffic and noise and dirt. And although I do love that part, um, but Taipei was almost um, European or certainly a lot more. You had more of that Japanese. Um, cleanliness and uh, organization, you know, and it actually reminded me a lot of, of cities like Vancouver. It has this beautiful scenic backdrop of the mountains and um, tai Taiwan is in general quite, quite green and so is Taipei. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of greenery and parks and we recycled uh, through Taipei. I had one of those guides and it was, uh, yeah, it was really neat. For thousands of years, Taiwan had been home to nine plain tribes. Eventually, Han Chinese began crossing the Taiwan Strait during the 15th century. And after, Taiwan was under many rules, including the Spanish, Dutch, Chinese and eventually Japanese from 1895 to 1945. Very cool. Um, so we saw some pictures of like the food markets and stuff that you sent us. Yes. How was that? I love the food markets. There's such uh, incredible, you know, culinary displays of culinary arts, really. And there's so much going on. There's so much great food to be had. And it's incredible the, the ingenuity of people. I mean, if you have two square feet, you know, that, that's all they need. And you have a clay pot and a fire and a roast and, or a grill and somebody's making fish and roasting things. And so it's, uh, it's incredible. Everything's fresh and, and you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And there's obviously things that, you know, you've never seen before. From the chicken feet to stinky tofu and you know beautiful deep fried crab and there was one dish in particular that um, had received um, a um, recommendation from the Michelin guide. And oh, it was oh, these crazy. Uh, yeah yeah for, for it's incredible for for like a, an outdoor market right. So um, and those were um, pepper buns. They were these sourdough buns made in a tandoor oven and then stuffed with um, uh, with ginger and um, scallions. Entrepreneurship and ingenuity knows no boundaries when it comes to conducting commas in the tightest of spaces here. The market air is filled with enticing scents and the variety is absolutely endless. These wonderful temples of culinary art would never be possible in the West. We tend to suppress creativity with too much regulation. So this is um, this is the Ali Shan Oolong, and what you do is you have one smelling cup and um, one uh, one cup you drink out of. So you just turn this around and then slowly let it out. And then this is what you smell. A really nice deep earthy baked flavor. Yeah? It's like roasted chestnuts and yeah, you can taste it. And it's got a nice sweetness to it as well. Right? And so with these teas, you can make about six to eight infusions. 
and every infusion is going to be slightly different than the next one. So the first one's usually weaker, and then the second, and third, and fourth are the best, and then it tapers down a bit. And how old is this tea? Uh, this is not an old tea. Tea doesn't, you know, I mean, there are great aged teas, but they, you know, there's obviously great young teas, and most people think, you know, the fresher the tea, the better. And that's, you know, there's certainly something to that, but it doesn't mean that it's always like that. There's some amazing aged teas, but this was just made. So this is a fresh tea from uh, actually last winter's harvest. I like the winter harvests on these teas, they're a bit smoother. So how are the people you met there? Oh, the hospitality is, is great. I um, People are so generous with their time and it's not unusual to meet somebody at 8 in the morning and this is the business meeting in the West we would probably give you about an hour. Over there people drive you around through the tea fields, take you for lunch, then go and taste teas for a few hours and then take you for dinner and then you go back to the tea shop and and this is all with kind of without expectations of anything. They're not expecting to get a lot of sales from you or anything like that. There's just a, a real generosity there that is refreshing, and I think the West can have, has a lot to learn from that. Please go. So, right. Wulong tea is not easy to make because you have to control yeah. equal. So, the best Wulong tea the master man can give you this one, this sweet, and full of. And that's so why oolongs are. If you buy yeah. oolong tea, small ball is a part of here. Right. Big ball is all of these. Yeah. So you need all of them too to make so a good oolong. So if you make a sample, just take a small one. Sure. Marty's hospitality was only surpassed by his knowledge and passion. We sampled over 30 teas, including a spectacular 1995 Dongding Oolong and a 1944 Taiwanese Hong Yu black tea. And what about this Laoshi you told me you met? So now I'm allowed to taste the nectar of the gods here. Laoshi started us off with a few basic Xin Xuans and swiftly moved on to a 15 year old Four Seasons Oolong from Lishan. Then the master pulled out a 1987 roasted oolong he crafted himself and the flavor profile was so complex that I struggled to put the experience into words. Oh wow. Oh wow. <laughs> wow. That is... That's just, that's just just all over the place. That's just... I mean, this is, it's woodsy, it's floral, it's... Yeah. it's, it's, it's Beautiful. Yes, Laoshi means Laoshi means teacher in Mandarin. So the old teacher. He was a, a friend of a friend that um, I got connected with, and uh, it was a bit of an honor because he's been in the tea industry for 50 years, and there are a lot of people looking up to him in terms of his knowledge. So he um, he uh, granted me a meeting at his uh, little shop, which was right around the corner from the hotel, and um, it almost felt like I had to go through a kind of test first. Um, you know, there were some teas laid out and um, he didn't really tell me what they were or anything and I made my comments and which one I thought was the better of them and with just a nod we kind of went on and then the next one came out and so then eventually the mood kind of lightened up a bit and he thought, okay, I was worth his time and, um, and then it became incredible. We tasted some really amazing teas and some teas that he had made 30 years ago, so that's where the, the HT comes in. And so they were quite spectacular. They just kept on giving and giving. So um, yeah, it was, it's it's uh, uh, he was an interesting man, and it was you know it was, uh, it was a pleasure for me to meet him. Yeah, So he's like he's teaching you what's a real tea. That is that is the nectar of the gods. It <laughs> really is. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he, you, you, think you, you know something about tea. So sure Thank you. Serious. Thank you. I always hoped so. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure what you were going to think. <laughs> so did you find Taiwan a lot different from China? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the language is the same. I mean, they do have a different accent, but I don't understand any of it anyway. My my 20 word vocabulary doesn't get me very far in Mandarin, but it is very much different from places that I that I have visited in China. Yes, um, it because Taiwan was occupied by the Japanese for 50 years. 
a lot of that that culture and that custom has taken hold, and um, it's it's quite visible in everything from what how it functions and what the streets look like to some of the more details and generally the I, I don't want to say cleanliness because of, you know that suggests that China is dirty or anything like that, but it's certainly less chaotic. It's much more structured in that in terms where you would find that in Japan, which is very very organized and. Um, very um, well done in, in, in many ways. So the, the Taiwan reminded me a lot of that. It's um, I did find it quite different. Yeah. Not many people know that uh, people when they associate Taiwan to tea, they will think oolong tea. But oolong is really a very recent phenomenon, um, especially the very fragrant high mountain style very flowery teas. That's really you know, in the last 15, 20, 20 years, let's say, 80s up to now. Uh, but beforehand, Taiwan's heyday in tea manufacturing was during the Japanese era. Mm -hmm. uh, this island was the only colony that Japan had from 1895 to the end of the Second World War. So during those 50 years, uh, Japan really contributed to develop the economy of this island and they had the grand plan of uh, developing a tea industry that would directly challenge the British tea industry. And not compete with their own, which is, which is pretty much only green tea. Exactly. Uh, I think the success uh, of our GABA stems from the fact that we only produce GABA in the springtime. <laughs> So after several hours and probably about 20 to 30 different teas or so, you think it's more like 30? I would say so. I'll go with that. It I feels feel like that. I feel appropriately wired now with, with uh, all the caffeine. Mm -hmm. And the carnage we've created is the, the second bowl of, of steeped leaves. Quite beautiful and it's only could make a salad out of this. Yeah, it's the recipe is fresh. fresh. So how does it feel to stand in a tea field on top of a mountain? Amazing. That's probably one of the you know, parts of my job I enjoy the most is going to the source and seeing where these beautiful products uh, that we decide to, to carry are, are crafted. And I, I was always connected to nature, I like the outdoors, and, but when you're standing in such a pristine, beautiful landscape with views over the mountains and complete quiet, and uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's very special, it's kind of humbling, it's very tranquil, and we just sit there and then talk about you know what teas are being produced and when and what they'd like to do next with it and it's uh, yeah it's it's very special and you know these areas are so pristine and beautiful. Yeah, I love that. It's been a perfect dry morning and the weather is optimal for harvesting. The skilled hands of the pickers are making swift work, severing the sod off the young shoots. It's only those tender leaves which will produce the elegant flavor profiles and contain the maximum level of antioxidants. Oh, it's hugely important. Where the tea is grown, you mean? Um, so there are a few parts that play a major role in that. Um, there's obviously the climate and the altitude and the soil. So it's what the wine world would call the terroir. Um, in the tea world, the higher the altitude, the more likely you'll find more intricate nuances in the leaf. And then also the soil. So if you have a soil that stresses the tea plant more, like a vine, for example, when it's when it grows into in a very rocky soil, it has to struggle a little bit more to 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 survive and to grow, and it it creates more complexity in the flavors. So you you end up with a better quality leaf from these high-grown, better regions. Then, for example, the low-growns and the plateaus, where you would make a basic tea bag style tea out of. Um, Having said that, then what happens in the factory is also hugely important because you can ruin a good tea in, in the factory by making it wrong or by firing it too long or by, by oxidizing it too long and so forth as well. But yes, the, the terroir is hugely important in, in, in the tea world. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
going to roll around in it. What lead do we have here? Is this Ching Ching? Is this, is this Padondi? After the initial processing, the tea leaves are brought inside to undergo more withering. This process can take up to 20 hours and contributes to further reduction of moisture in the leaf. The leaves are then placed in the bamboo tumbler, which bruises the tea and triggers the oxidization process. This machine is unique to oolong production. Here the oxygen interacts with the enzyme in the raw material and starts to turn the leaf brown. This is similar to cutting up an apple and see it turn color over several hours. This process, or lack thereof, defines essentially the difference between white, green, oolong and black tea. The level of oxidization for oolongs can be between, between 15 and 80 percent, depending on which style of tea is being produced. After the desired amount of oxidization, the tea is divided into batch sizes and moved to the kill green stage. Katie's dryer introduces heat at 200 degrees Celsius and eliminates any enzymatic action in the leaf, therefore locking in the flavor profiles. The tea maker's experience is crucial here in determining the precise time of when to move the leaves to the next step. I once asked a tea master with over 50 years of experience how he knew the tea had been needed enough in this walk. He told me that your hands would know. Tea making like this is an ancient craft and has little to do with the mass-produced dust we find in some commercial brands. Can you tell us about the tradition of, so I saw the photo with the guy with the ball. Oh, the Ti Kuan Yin, the rolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a, it's, it's, um, we see that for the first time, it's, uh, I think most people don't it's think weird. that tea is made like that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, Ti Kuan Yin and, and many other oolongs, um, as well as something like gunpowder green tea, they're rolled in these tight little pebbles. I mean, basically what you see here, right? Because this is, yeah. this is actually the, the deep baked Ti Kuan Yin that you saw being made in, in the film. So, this, this tight little twist is accomplished by rolling it over and over again. So, the leaves go into this ball, which is then tightly, tightly rolled, and then rolled again in the, in the secondary machine in the roller. Then it rests a little bit, it comes out, it breaks, being broken apart again, it goes back into the dryer, so it's, it's heated up again, broken apart, and that, that happens about 40 to 50 times. So it's a really, oolongs are, are, are difficulties to make, it can take up to 36 hours, and um, there are many, there's much opportunity for, for things to, to go wrong, and, and you end up with an inferior product. So the, the tea master's hand, is, the skill is very important, you know. Mr. Lin has been working all night because his helper is sick and his teenage sons are showing no desire to participate in the tea business. The lack of interest in this line of hard work by the younger generations is manifesting a global threat to the high-end, small-scale tea industry. Taiwan, as well as some other tea-producing countries, are faced with the possibility that in 20 years there may be very few people left that understand the art of tea making. Generations of tea producing families may cease production as their children are migrating to cities in search for a more glamorous life. In order to achieve this tightly twisted style, the leaves must be re-rolled multiple times. Each time the leaves go into the dryer for one to two minutes and are wrapped in two layers of cloth. The cloth is shaped into a tight ball and then placed in the roller again and again. Other rollers like this one back at Katie's factory employ a lighter style rolling and produce a larger curled leaf. And how much moisture are you looking for about in the in the finished leaf until until you move it further? Mm, but this is less less uh, yesterday. 
mm -hmm. park in the so, city yeah. and now maybe around 20 hours 20 hours okay Mm, it smells yeah, amazing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, a little bit mango. Yes. Uh, definitely. Mango and a little spice is there too. Cassia. Today, Katie is producing a Dongding oolong harvested at the beautiful gardens we visited in the morning. Taiwan is also home to a unique species of the tea plant, Camea formonensis. This is an endemic species of the tea family which occurs exclusively in Taiwan. Formosa, of course, is the old name for Taiwan, just like Ceylon is to Sri Lanka. Originally, these wild-growing tea plants were considered wild Camea sinensis. However, recent studies using DNA analysis showed clear genetic differences of the entire species. The common name of this plant is Hong Yu, and contributes to much of Taiwan's tea production. There was more fruity smell before, but now it's kind of gone. And the leaves are shocked, right? So I think the smell will disappear for a little while. When the kill green process has been completed, the leaves are taken out of the dryer. At this point, the leaf still contains moisture and is pliable. The tea is allowed to rest and slowly cool before the shaping and final drying process. For this, the tea is placed in a sealed container to ensure that the moisture doesn't dissipate too quickly. Before the Industrial Revolution, human ingenuity came up with other methods to process tea, like this beautiful restored wooden roller. Yeah, okay. Yes. So you need me for that? Yes. Leaves in here. Yes. 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 So this is yes. an ancient Take this trip to Taiwan? Well, I have always kind of wanted to go, and, um, and I do love oolong teas, and Taiwan is, is, is famous for their oolongs, and, and they produce some of the world's best. And um, there, there are many contacts we have in the world where we buy tea from, and some of them are in Taiwan. And, uh, but in this world we live in, you don't necessarily have to travel to see everybody all the time. So it was time for me to, to deepen some of those connections and to learn more and find out a bit more about um, Taiwanese teas and maybe find some new gems. And we did. So I found some, some new teas that we brought and, um, and I learned a bit more about you know, Taiwan and its culture and its history and its teas. And, um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was for that reason to, to just learn a little bit more. Where's the next tea journey leading me to? To be quite honest, I don't know yet what's around the corner. Tea is my passion, and I, I look forward to finding new treasures for Tea Squared, whenever, wherever that may be. In the meantime, I hope this inspired you to explore the wonderful world of tea for yourself, and perhaps start a journey of your own into the origins of the world's most nourishing beverage.